Hey guys, a couple comments before I get into the lecture itself, and the text is on here if you want to skim and save yourself some time. This lecture isn't image heavy, and the text that's here is there so I can stay on topic while I'm making this, and so that you can skim the slides while you're reviewing. You can and should listen to this like a podcast. And Jimmy says hi. You won't miss anything major, so... You know, don't feel like your eyeballs have to be on this because this is visually very, very boring. Um, this is going to be about mental health in the ancient world. And in order to talk about that, I have to mention abuse, self-harm, suicide, death, mental illness. Um, I'm going to try to do it in a gentle and non-graphic sort of way. But I realize that we are in a period of great stress. Um, my mental health has been impacted a lot. I'm sure yours has too. So first and foremost, take care of yourselves. If you're not in a place where you can listen to a lecture that just even touches on any of these and be safe, contact me and we'll come up with a doable alternative. Um, this can be anything from modifications to the version of the final exam you take to um, a limited version of this lecture. Just like, let me know what does and does not work for you, and we'll come up with a way for you to enjoy the stuff that's going to be useful to you safely, and to skip on the stuff that's going to be harmful. So without any further ado, let's get into the content of the lecture. Okay. Hi. And Jimmy is really happy to see you. Hey guys, uh, it's time to talk mental health. Um, before we go here though, let me just say, it, it's, it's been a month, hasn't it? It's more than a month. Um, it's been so good hearing from you. I know you guys are dealing with a lot and you're, you're in my hot heart and in my thoughts. And uh, my hope with this is that it's going to be more helpful than problematic. Um, but I'm going to get it up here early. So if you need to pause, if you need to step away, you're going to have that space. But I also wanted to get it up here because I think for some of you, this may be helpful content for dealing with the realities in which you find yourselves. Um, there's so little I can do to help you guys right now. I hope this at least is something. So here we go. Before we get into the weeds, I want to introduce you to our readings for this section. And here I've put them in chronological order. I've arranged them thematically in the reading list for this unit. You'll recognize um, Hippocratic Dreams and Artemidorus from the, the second bit of the unit. That's because they both deal with the use of dreams for uh, medical diagnosis and also dream interpretation as a modality for dealing with anxiety. And also dream interpretation is fun. I'm not going to say a lot about either author because these are authors that speak for themselves really easily. I think in part because we dream. This is something that we have in common with humans everywhere and in all times. And it's really interesting to see just how much common ground there is. Ancient people had recurring dreams that look a lot like my recurring dreams, including the one where your teeth are falling out. Uh, this is a really common one. A lot of people have it. So if you're in the group that has the te teeth falling out dream, hi, welcome to the club. Sucks, doesn't it? Uh, ancient people tried to figure out what to do with that too. A couple notes about what to do specifically with Hippocratic dreams. Um, these are really more observations than they are guidance or background information. Hippocratic dreams focuses a lot on the night sky, and that might seem a little weird to us, but this is something that has changed a lot, and not that long ago either. Since the invention of electricity, our relationship with the sky has been dramatically altered. 
before electric lights were a thing and light pollution became a part of our landscape, skyscape, the night sky was not just something pretty that we looked at and enjoyed, but it was a functional item. Before the invention of reliable timekeeping, this was your watch. During the day, you could use shadows, sundials, um, water clocks were somewhat useful, but you have to keep putting water in them. In general, timekeeping is new, and when it first became a, a thing in industrial contexts, and here we're talking the early to mid-1800s, it was really controversial, and activists pushed back hard on it because being able to record the hours in your day and then hold people accountable to keeping that kind of granular schedule is not the way people lived for hundreds and hundreds of years. The rhythm of sunrise, sunset, agricultural duties, um, tasks that you had to perform within the context of a flexible day, that was how your time happened. And uh, the rhythms and needs of caring for your family, for your livestock, for your farm chores, if you had farm animals in the city, um, you'd still have some really flexible time. And also industrial contexts as we know them were not a thing, asterisk. There were early versions of the structures that later lead to managed farms and industrial complexes and factories. But they're not run on clocks. You're not paid so much for your time. Now there's a dark side to this because a lot of this labor was done by enslaved people who would have experienced the kind of, um, uh, what these activists called the, the tyranny of the clock the need to keep to a schedule. And in fact, one of the things advocates would point out is that by using clocks to measure labor and pay, you were doing to people not enslaved what was done to enslaved people in that time and that place. So that's a problematic activist stance because they're essentially admitting that managed time and enslavement is cruel. But then again, early abolitionist movements lent into this. So this does provide a factor that led to emancipation, but also it's just weird. It's historically weird for us to need to be at a place at two o'clock and awake and functional because we get paid to do that. And it's important to remember this, it's something history can do for us, is to point out that the rhythms we live by aren't natural, they aren't necessary, they aren't even normal from a historical point of view. And perhaps one of the things that we can use history to address and ameliorate is our relationship to timekeeping and timepieces. Um, if there's any bright spot in the ludicrousness we're living through now, um, some of the structure has been removed from our time. However, this isn't a great experiment in unstructured time, is it? Because we still have to keep some of our time to schedule. And we also have to continue to work as if we had a dedicated workspace when in fact we do not. And as many of you are telling me, <laughs> that's hard. Yes, it is very, very difficult to do work that has been structured for dedicated time slots and dedicated spaces for that work into unstructured domestic spaces psychologically very difficult. And there's a historical context that sympathizes with you. Yes, you're not broken. The system is super broken. And now we're dealing with a broken version of a broken system. So if you're feeling stressed, if you're feeling under pressure, if you're feeling like an utter failure, 
part of it is because you're being asked to do something that's kind of biologically unreasonable. If that makes you feel any better, I hope it does. I don't know if it helps, but there we are. Uh, my point was, the night sky used to be the closest thing you had to a timekeeper. Interestingly, it's a lot more accurate than daytime timekeeping because the stars that are not the planets, that is stars that bring us light from objects outside of the solar system, move across the night sky at a regular pace. They can be measured by the location of the horizon relative to constellations. In ancient cosmologies, there were a couple different explanations for why this was so. And early models of the universe were created in order to explain why some stars didn't move with the rest of the stars, why some planet, or rather some stars wandered. The word for wander in Greek is planetes, uh, planeomaia, it's just, that's the verb. Um, used in good health. Greek's fun. Take Greek. It's fantastic. Um, so a star that wanders around the night sky is not like the other stars and hence is a planet. It's a, it's a wandery star. But this isn't just what we now call planets. Asteroids are involved. Even comets are technically a kind of planet. Um, any object that isn't moving with the constellations falls into this category. And this has caused us problems because it's a legacy term. So when, um, what is it, the AAU decided to redefine planet in such a way that Pluto got um, demoted, I think is harsh. Pluto got included with a growing class of objects in the Kuiper belt. Sorry, guys, I'm kind of pro this because it makes sense. Uh, I get the logic. But part of why we had to have that conversation is that the term planet no longer makes sense because we know that all stars move. It's just that on a human time scale, the stars, or rather the objects that are closest to us, we can perceive motion. The objects that are far from us enough that they seem to be motionless relative to each other, or just very, 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 very far, like massive orders of magnitude farther. Um, full disclosure, all of my science credits were in astronomy in college, so I um, love this shit. And if I were not uh, learning disabled in math, I might have gone into astro. So now I do history of astronomy for funsies. <clears throat> this brings me back, let's see, where are we? I was making a point, yes. <clears throat> this focus then on the position of the planets and where certain stars are going is not just this weird thing that's going on in the Hippocratic Treatise. This would have been really relatable. Your average ancient Greek person would have known what the stars were named. They would have had to pay really close attention, not just to how the stars moved every night, but also over the course of the year, because the position of constellations relative to the horizon changes as the Earth moves around the sun. They would say as the sky moves around the Earth, but not all of them. Some of them were heliocentrists. And there's no point in being smug because one model is right and another was wrong. Like they did pretty darn well. So stop beating up on ancient astronomers. <clears throat> you would be intensely aware of which constellation was visible where in the night sky at what part of the year, because not getting that right meant that your crops would be planted too late, your harvest would fail and everybody would die. So astronomy wasn't just a hobby, this was high stakes stuff. And it wasn't just for astrology as we understand it today. It was a really practical method for predicting what you should do now so you don't screw up later. In that context, it makes a lot of sense that humans and early scientists would extrapolate, in fact, why am I making that distinction? 
All humans engage in science to some degree. Every time you try to rationally extrapolate facts um, from knowns, uh, rather to extract unknowns from known facts, you're doing science. Now, we hold academic science to a higher standard for very, very good reasons. However, scientific thought is an alien. It isn't different. It isn't restricted to just a few. But there are people who spend more time and effort doing this. It just as in ancient medicine, these people specialize in medicine. In ancient astronomy, you have specialists. But also there's no clear disciplinary boundary between astronomy and astrology yet because ancient science had yet to tease out the degree to which observations of patterns in the sky were artifacts of um, a human uh, cognitive bias towards creating order and how much of it was data that was being accurately interpreted. So for an ancient scientist, it's not unreasonable to think that the position of the stars are gonna have a bearing on health or on human decision-making or behavior because the position of the stars does have a correlation to agricultural rhythms. It has a correlation to the life cycles of plants, of insects, of birds, you know, all these other parts of ancient landscapes that would have been intimately and daily familiar. We are isolated in large part from non-human organisms. We don't have the close relationship with our animal and insect and reptilian and plant relatives in the same way that ancient people did. And now, this takes us as far as Hippocratic dreams. Um, I'm not saying that this is advice you can take to the bank. I'm just making a case for a gentle and generous approach to texts that to our eyes seem like astrology and seem like fortune telling and prediction. Our bias, because of who we are as modern people, is going to be to look at this and say, ah, sorcery. Now, ancient people did this too, because as I said, this was a border that was still being negotiated. Some ancient people believed in the premises of astrology, that the position of the stars have an observable effect on life on Earth. There were other scientific thinkers who were like, no, no, uh, because of X, Y, and Z, we can prove that this isn't a thing. Um, we cannot prove that astrology works and therefore rational people should exclude it. This is really relevant when we talk about the role of dream interpreters and practitioners of um, things we would see as supernatural medicine, um, also sacred medicine. This isn't the first time dreams have been part of the diagnostic process, yeah? This is a big part of what's going on at Epidaurus too. But also we see a Hippocratic author using dreams as a diagnostic tool. So this border that people are defending between what is appropriate for rational scientists and what is outside of the expertise of self-identified scientists. Uh, their word for this would be philosophers, which is the subject of the rest of this lecture, yeah? It's different, it's different. Gosh, I've gone on. So I'll just leave you there with Hippocratic dreams and a little bit about Artemidorus. Now I've given you dates for both. There's a huge gap in time between regimen for Hippocratic dreams and Artemidorus. A lot's happened. There have been advances in all branches of science, especially astronomy. Like astronomy has really gone by leaps and bounds, but not just astronomy. The practice of astrology changes materially between the 5th century and the 2nd century CE. 
you know, 700 years, things change. Modern astrology doesn't look like ancient astrology. In fact, the modern sky doesn't look like the ancient sky due to the um, procession of the equinoxes, which if you're really interested, you can look it up. It's super cool, but okay. One fun fact. In the ancient world, in the time span we're covering from the 5th century BCE to the 2nd century CE, the North Star wasn't the North Star. The North Star only processed into the space where the North Pole on our planet is at about um, the 700s, 800s CE, um, and really not until we get into the thousands CE is the North Star in North. It's moving out. It's not going to always be the North Star, but it will be again uh, because the Earth has a wobble and that wobble creates a, a little micro circle up around the polar areas. In ancient times, there wasn't a star there. It was a blank space that the Big Dipper circled around. And that's why it's sometimes called the plow, because it plows in this eternal track around north. So you would find north by looking for the central point around which um, the Big Dipper pivots. Nifty, huh? Okay, pause for a second, baby. And uh, the recording didn't pause, it stopped, and no way I'm going to say all that again. So <clears throat> continuing where we left off on the last identical slide. Um, Artemidorus is trying to apply philosophical, um, that is, scientific rationale to dream interpretation. And I've given you his introduction because this is where he lays out his methods. And for some people in the ancient world, in fact, for probably the majority of ancient people in the ancient world, Lord, that was redundant. Going to a dream interpreter was part of your health care and not necessarily physical health, but physical health is part of it. However, for elites, especially elites who had had a formal education, it was considered uh, not mainstream health care. This doesn't mean they didn't consider it valid, however. Um, from Roman legal precedent, we know that the line was drawn for people who could have official status as town doctor to exclude dream interpreters, fortune tellers, faith healers. This tells us that a difference was felt in professional category between dream interpreters and doctors by some people in the ancient world. But for other people in the ancient world, one of their first stops when they had a weird dream or when they had symptoms and they wanted to figure out like should i go to a doctor should i sacrifice to the gods like i need some advice and this is super freaky they would go to a dream interpreter now artemidorus is attempting and you can be the judge of how well he does this but he's attempting to give us a rational and somewhat standardized approach to dream interpretation that disambiguates context, right? So he talks about um, diagnostically relevant dreams, like prophetic dreams and just dream dreams. Um, he calls them an hypneon, is a regular dream dream where you're just doing what you do when you're awake, when you're asleep, like but in Oneros, he says, like, that's a diagnostically relevant dream. That's what he's going to talk about, which is a clinical question. Yeah. And then he goes on to say, you know, some dreams are about the world. Sometimes they're about your country. Sometimes they're about your community, your family, yourself. So we have this nested inverted pyramid of how to determine what dreams are relevant to what situations, which is nifty. But the bulk of his work, of which I've only had you read a little bit, the most fun bits, in my opinion. Um, I'm not sure what this tells you about me and my priorities, but enjoy. 
takes situation by situation, different categories of dreams, and gives you what's meant to be a less biased, less subjective way of interpreting them. I admire him for doing this. I think it's a great impulse. It's a telling impulse. It tells us a lot about the kinds of expectations that people had, even people who go to a dream interpreter, they want some kind of a system in place that they can replicate, that they can understand. It's a lot like the kinds of systems that are built around astrology or various religious traditions of interpreting dreams, of interpreting omens. This isn't something that's remote from our day-to-day -day lives. Even like BuzzFeed quizzes can fall into this category. We do this for a reason. Even those of us who have hesitations about accessing this kind of procedure. Um, now, I'm not saying everybody does it. There's some people who, for religious reasons, don't partake. Some people just aren't into it. I'm not being judgy. I'm just pointing out that this is still part of our world. And that should tell us something. Like, this is meeting a need. So the question for you, and I don't have a great answer for this, I think that's more interesting, yeah? Um, part of why I'm having you read this is to ask yourselves, what did this do for ancient people? Why was this one of the texts that survived for us to have today? Why did people feel like they needed to copy this by hand? It's a huge book. It's massive, Artemidorus. So why? Why Artemidorus? We're missing like 99% of the literature written in antiquity, including scientific literature. The fact that it's here tells us something really important about the ancient world. Now, as modern people looking at it, it also tells us something about what we have in common with ancient people, but also what's different. One of the things that I love about Artemidorus is in giving us common scenarios for ancient people's dreams, he's telling us a lot about what the world looked like through an ancient person's subjective gaze. And what's super interesting to me is that his default ancient person isn't elite. In fact, it's not even a free person. He addresses the dreams of enslaved people. He addresses, well, a little bit. His default patient seems to be male, but he does address sometimes women dreamers. But even his default patient tells us something really useful about who's going to Artemidorus. Um, probably it's telling us about who has the money to afford Artemidorus, which is a different question than who's going to dream interpreters. Yes, this is who has money to pay for a fancy pants dream interpreter. Uh, nevertheless, it's just a super interesting text. I hope you enjoy it, work through it, think about it. Um, one of the things you might consider doing as a project is to interpret one of your dreams. See what Artemidorus has to say about it. And in fact, I think I'm going to put the full text of the translation with the index. So if you want to, you can use the index to look up search terms and see if Artemidorus has advice for you. And tell me about it, because that's a super useful and interesting exercise. One of my favorite things to do in the um, the winter term magic course I teach, which some of you have taken, so you're familiar with this. Oof. Okay, finally, finally, we get to Galen's Passions of the Soul, which is the latest author, but also the first thing I have you reading. Because in some ways, Galen's approach looks the closest to what modern therapy looks like. In fact, a lot of the things that Galen suggests that you do will be familiar to you if you've ever done cognitive behavioral therapy in any capacity. There's a lot of breaking down emotional processes, of creating steps for self-improvement. It's also got a lot in common with self-help books. It's relatable. 
And for that reason, one of the exercises I've suggested that you do linked to Galen's Passions of the Soul is to try it or create a like hypothetical person that you try it for because I don't want to cause psychological harm and I don't necessarily think that Galen's advice is always healthy for everyone because there's a lot of introspection and self-judgment that can border on the toxic, especially if you're already hyper conscientious like me. I beat myself up enough. Galen doesn't need to help. But if you're feeling up for it, try it. Um, now, part of the challenge of dealing with Galen that I feel I should warn you about, you're familiar with this dude, yeah? He's chatty. And this was meant to be performed just like on prognosis, yeah? So this is a little bit like an ancient TED Talk, only if a TED Talk is as long as one of my lectures. I'm so sorry, guys. Why am I judging Galen? I do this too. One way to access this is to perform it, read it with friends. Another way to access this is to skim and look for the action items. Uh, he spends a lot of time telling you cool stories about Galen that illustrate his points. Again, I really can't be calling him out for this because I do it. So there we are. But if you can tease out the advice and action items from amongst Galen's helpful or not so helpful personal stories and testimonials, then you might be able to kind of cut through the noise a little bit. I'm going to walk you through the basics, the things to look for when you're looking for applicable sound bites. Galen, when he's talking about passions of the soul, it's kind of a difficult word to translate. What he's referring to are actions that we take, or rather, let me, no, no, I think that's fair. He's talking about this mental process that happens when we have an emotion, yeah? So a feeling happens, and that feeling motivates us to do a thing. And that thing that our feelings want us to do often is a really toxic thing. Some of it's learned behavior, some of it's just being human, yeah? Our first impulse when we're under the influence of a strong emotion, uh, a strong reaction, is not always a healthy one. Galen recognizes this, so that's what he's trying to help us with is, okay, what do you do when you have an overpowering feeling? Now, the one he really focuses in on is anger. And in this, I do see a, a correlation because this is relatable. I don't think any one of us has not done something we regret in a moment of anger, yeah? We all have it in us to become violent when we're angry, to be unfair to the people we love when we're angry, to be hurtful, to be untrue, to be unkind. Uh, it is not... Uh, Galen, I think, would say it's a pathology. I'm not sure I agree with him that far. But he is right that it's destructive. And anger is particularly problematic because it leads you to harm other people. And as a doctor, this must have been something he saw in his patients. I mean, he decides to tell us stories about his mom who had an anger management problem, which is really interesting. There's a lot to unpack there. But I wonder if part of what he's thinking about is patients that he saw who were victims of violence, of um, you know, domestic blow-ups, of um, fist fights with their mates. But he also talks about self-harm too, um, hence the, the content warnings I put up here at the beginning. I'm not gonna unpack this too much, but I think it's worth discussing. He talks about how anger doesn't just make you hurt other people, 
anger makes you do things that harm yourself. Now, he's not talking about things like cutting, although we could put that in this variety of things. Hi, Spouse. Mm. Hello, students. <laughs> spouse greets you. But he talks about how one of his friends, I love how it's his friend, uh, is that really your friend, Galen, really? Goes to unlock a door and a key won't fit and the door sticks and then his friend loses it and he punches the door and he like I think he's like biting something like he bites the key at one point he talks about people biting rocks when they're angry I have questions Galen who bit a rock at you did you bite a rock but I've been that mad um and full disclosure, I'm being super salty, but I have assaulted a door that failed to open when I needed it to open. And let's not talk about what I do to my computer when my computer is not obeying me. Um, okay, Galen, I feel seen and a little judged, but his plan is meant to help you use the power, and here's where it gets a little toxic, the power of other people being judgmental to control your passions. Now, it's not just talking about anger. He talks about overeating, um, eating your feelings of excessive grief. Uh, for Galen, emotion in general is problematic for reasons we're going to talk about a bit. Um, in fact, if you're pressed for time, just this slide will get you where you need to go. I'm going to talk about other philosophical schools. There's a lot of context here that I think is going to be useful and helpful, but mostly I just want to get you into a space to understand how Galen's positioning himself against his competition and the kind of ideas that are informing his therapeutic practice. So he talks about getting yourself what I like to call a criticism buddy. Galen doesn't call him call it that. He's like, get an older dude whose behavior you respect. And then you have to pin this person down and get them to commit to tell you the truth about yourself. And if they tell you that you're doing everything all right, they're lying because nobody does everything right. So you need to like press them until they tell you the gosh darn truth. And if they won't tell you the truth about yourself, that you're controlled by your passions, you should find another criticism buddy. And then you take that feedback from this person and then you apply it to yourself first when people are watching, then with your door open. And then your end goal is that you're going to be so in control of your passions, of your emotions, that even if you're, say, alone in your apartment with your malfunctioning laptop, you will not assault the laptop because you have created the mental apparatus to keep your emotions from owning your actions, which is nifty. Um, I, I'm not sure that you could get IRB approval for this, which is why I'm not making you do it. But it does sound familiar. And I'm sure those of you who've taken psychology and who are aspiring to go into mental health work recognize some things that we still do for patients who are trying to process anxiety, anger management, um, I, you know, strong emotions, even emotions that ascend to the level of personality disorders. Yeah, um, A lot of personality disorders are extreme versions of what Galen's describing here, of passions that override your ability to navigate your life in a way that doesn't destroy yourself, the people you love, and the relationships that sustain you. You know, it's nice somebody's on the job. Without any further ado then, let's talk about ancient philosophy and what therapy looked like for ancient folks. Now that we've talked about the readings, we're going to move into the context part of this lecture. Those of you who've taken philosophy classes may be familiar with some of these yeah. movements yeah. from philosophy. Yeah. 
I know, I know. Timmy is just so delighted to help. Um, we're going to talk, however, about ancient philosophical movements as forms of therapy, because this is part of why people did philosophy in the ancient world and what philosophy was trying to accomplish. Um, this is something that you can miss a lot when you're in the weeds of what different philosophical approaches um, are trying to talk about and prove. But the reason behind many of these discussions of the nature of reality and um, how morality works is an attempt to make a better world and to create a better experience for people living in the world that existed in, in ancient times, yeah? So let's start with the Epicureans. Yay! Yeah. Which is, um, full disclosure, one of my favorites, even though it's um, not a worldview I embrace as such. But I think that um, the Epicureans are a much maligned ancient philosophical movement. Yeah, I know. Just hold it together for one slide. Yes, hi. Epicureans' main goal in creating a vision of the universe is to oh, maximize uh, good stuff and minimize bad stuff not just on a day-to-day -day basis but in a big picture kind of way so an epicurean is going to tell you to approach your life in such a way that your long-term good is going to be um, maximized and insured so this is about sustainable good, in other words. And it's important to say this because uh, Epicureans' critics tend to accuse them of uh, enabling hedonism. People who don't like Epicureans talk about them like they're completely focused on pleasure and they're just trying to enable all kinds of destructive, harmful, consuming behaviors. Um, the, if you've heard a little bit about Epicureans, you might have heard of them as uh, people who just love to eat good food all the time and uh, are sexually liberated in an uncontrolled and dangerous way. Um, there's so much to unpack there. I'm not going to do it. Okay. Um, that I'm just going to leave that there. Epicureans would say that pleasure isn't necessarily bad, that pleasure is something that tells us that we are experiencing good, but they also believed that just your immediate gratification in a situation can't be the only reason why you do it. You have to think not just about how an action makes you feel now, but what the consequences are going to be to your happiness a week from now, a month from now, a year from now. Hold it together, James. Oh. Pardon me. So an Epicurean would say about cookies that a cookie, sure, it gives you pleasure. That's important. That's wonderful. But if you eat too many cookies today, you could get an upset stomach tomorrow. Uh, your health can deteriorate over time. And therefore, you can't just live off cookies because in the long term, it's going to cause you more pain than pleasure. So it's not a ban on cookies, but it's eating cookies in such a way that you maximize the good that comes from cookie eating and you minimize the bad. In other words, it's a move away from the kind of pleasure shaming that you see in other parts of ancient culture. Um, you may have noticed a lot of judginess about people eating the wrong thing or drinking too much or having sex in a way that other people don't like. Uh, Epicureans are a space where they're like, okay, pleasure is not the enemy. Pleasure is not bad. It's just about enjoying pleasure in a way that keeps you safe and balances uh, needs with wants. And that's kind of cool. The next thing about Epicureans that's really interesting is that they're an atheistic system of 
philosophy. In other words, they don't believe that there is a god or gods in control of the universe. Rather, they believe that the universe is a material and mechanistic uh, situation, that all that we see around us is made up of these physical components. And then if you cut physical components to their smallest, smallest unit, that final unit that's too small to be cut in half, then you have found the smallest building block of reality, a thing that they called atomos, or the thing that cannot be cut. You may recognize tome from anatomy. Anatomy is cutting up. Atomy is the, the can't cut it. So this is the earliest articulation of the idea that atoms exist. So it's kind of nifty, yeah? Uh, eventually, this is going to be a very productive line of inquiry in science as well as in philosophy. Oh, yes. I'm a very good hairdresser. Um, for the Epicureans, then, they believed that the motion and the joining and dissolution of atoms is what makes up the mechanistic universe, and that atoms continuously engage, form units, and eventually will disperse, but that the atoms themselves persist, they continue, and that their motion is what makes the universe dynamic and uh, exciting and surprising. There's a lot of joy in this view of looking at the cosmos, but there are also some practical applications to this, that if you believe that there aren't gods. The gods don't curse you. The gods don't bless you. Uh, the gods aren't judging you. And that the only life you get is the life that you get when your atoms are in the configuration that make up you and your soul. They also believe the soul was made of atoms. Hi, yes, hi. Your mom's an atom. What? Um, yes, hi. He's helping. Um, Trout, what was I talking about? Yes. Um, when your atoms are together, forming the thing that is you, that is your life. And this doesn't mean that you can just do whatever the heck you want, that you can become a horrible, selfish, awful person. Not so much because that's destructive to everyone else's happiness, although that's part of it, right? They believe that happiness is formed when you're in a good relationship with your community and that it's not just your happiness epicureans are after right so it's not a selfish individual happiness because if you take away someone else's happiness you're increasing the unhappiness of the world and if the world is just what we experience right now right if our life is the only thing that this configuration of atoms gets to experience then we have a responsibility to our fellow man to make sure that we don't cause them undue pain this idea that there is no afterlife there's no second chance there's no going back um, they say it, it isn't a license to just haul off and be terrible. What it is, is a motivator to do it right now, to enjoy life in the present, and to be fully present for it. That's, that's sweet. I'm kind of okay with that. They then go on to say that this desire for pleasure ultimately promotes ethical living, that if you go for true pleasure, and true pleasure in the system is knowledge, wisdom, understanding, intellectual fulfillment, relationship fulfillment, um, having enough to be full and healthy and cared for, but not too much and not too little either, um, and not also dominating resources so that your community is miserable, thus increasing your own misery. Uh, because of this, pleasure, when properly thought about and not rejected, 
is good. Um, I'm going to end with a quotation from Philodemus. This is uh, a fragment of Epicurean philosophy found in a Herculaneum papyrus. Okay, there you go. Take your cookie and go. Thank you. Don't fear God. Don't worry about death. What is good is easy to get. And what is terrible is easy to endure. So let's unpack this. What does Philodemus mean by this? Starting with the don't fear God and don't worry about death. Um, they don't pretend that um, these things aren't scary, but rather they say, okay, you don't have to fear God or gods. Jim, shush, because that doesn't exist. And if you think about most of the gods in the ancient Mediterranean, that's kind of comforting, yeah? They're not going to smite you. They're not going to kidnap you. They're not going to pressure you into sex. Um, because they don't exist. The next thing up is not to worry about death. That because all things die, and because your death is inevitable, worrying about it just makes you more unhappy. So it's not don't worry about death as in like don't contemplate death, don't think about it, but rather you can't control the fact of death, but you can control the way that you react to death. You can decide not to worry about it and to use your living days to um, enjoy other things, which leads us to the next bit. So what is good is easy to get. Um, this might give you some pause because, of course, in the ancient world as today, different people have access to different kinds of goods and necessities. What he means by this is not everybody can afford a lifetime supply of cookies. What he means is that what is good, like what is really good, love, community feeling, um, discovery, knowledge, learning, thinking, experiencing, it's easy to get that all of us who have rational thought have the ability to experience happiness and that many of the things that lead to happiness and success and content, James, don't cost money and can be increased by making good decisions about how to be in the life given to you. The next bit, we also have to unpack a bit because this of these four statements is what I find most jarring and challenging. What is terrible is easy to endure. What he means by this is not that terrible things are good or easy or praise words like he's not saying terrible things are easy this isn't like a uh, what life gives you is only enough that you're strong enough to endure it rather what he's saying is that when terrible things happen to you and they absolutely will you can endure them by controlling your reaction to them and by understanding why they're happening um, in other words when people act unjustly, they are to be pitied in a way, because when you act in a destructive way, you're only destroying your own happiness. You're wrecking your ability to experience community. So a person who has made good choices about their life and has chosen wise pleasures, when unjust, horrible, awful things happen to them, um, they know that it's not their fault, right? That a god hasn't cursed them, they haven't done anything wrong. It's just sometimes the atoms move in a way that causes you pain. It's just what it is. It's not personal. It's just life. But also, 
understanding that the pain you experience in the moment is something that will end when your atoms disperse. It's not going to last forever. Um, if you're patient and if you're rational and if you process things in a, a measured and compassionate way, it makes them easier to live with. Now, I'm not saying I believe any of this personally, and I'm not telling you guys you have to either. This is just Epicureanism in a one slide nutshell. What else did I want to say in terms of a takeaway here? Ah, yes. A part of Epicurean optimism and hope in the face of death involves this idea of the permanence of atoms. So I've talked about while your atoms are together forming the thing that is you. That's your life. But Although we all die, our atoms don't. In fact, <laughs> our atoms, oh God, you're so heavy. <laughs> our atoms are necessary so that new life and new structures can form. Our atoms dissolve on our death and become part of other living things. So we are the atoms of our ancestors. We are the atoms that make up our world. There is an essential kinship between everything within the cosmos. And when you die, you do kind of have an afterlife. Not an afterlife as yourself, but all of the particles that came together to make your soul and your experience return to the universe, and then they become something new. Um, Epicureans believe that everything moves, everything changes, and that change isn't something to be feared, it's not something to be hated, it's not something to be anxious about. The change is good, change is necessary. If atoms don't move, then the cosmos ceases to function and this beautiful beautiful world in which we live ceases to be so our death makes way for the ongoing life of the cosmos death isn't meaningless just because we don't have an afterlife for epicureans death is a contribution it's a gift that feeds back into making the world the wonderful uh, multi-sensory experience it is. So that's Epicureanism. If you're interested in this, if this is really working for you as a system, um, I'm going to include a link to Lucretius's On the Nature of Things, which is a Latin poem explaining Epicurean philosophy. It's long, but it's really good. Um, some of you may be familiar with the swerve. I have some methodological disagreements with its basic premises, but you might also enjoy reading that too. So I'll put this in the episode notes if you want to learn more about Epicureanism. Uh, for those of you who are in our Latin track, we're reading Lucretius in, in the fall. So there's more of this where it came from. Um, and on a personal note, um, as you guys know, I am a religious person. This isn't my worldview, but I have a great deal of respect and affection for Epicureanism and Epicurean approaches to life. Um, and I think that's a good thing, yeah? We we are not always fed by encounters with people whose ideas we accept wholly. You can find value in ideas you disagree with and things that um, don't reflect your worldview or your truth. And that's also a wonderful thing. I think it's a 
an act of generosity and of empathy that ultimately builds towards um, human good. <laughs> All right. If I don't give him some Mr. Rogers soon, I think we're going to have noise. So I'll come back for our next philosophical school in a minute. Next up on our tour are the Stoics. You've probably heard of these cats. These are the philosophical school that deeply informed the thought of the Emperor Marcus Aurelius, whom you may remember as Galen's boss for the uh, main parts of his career. Stoicism heavily informs Galen's approach to self-help and therapy in uh, passions and errors of the soul. So keep this in the back of your mind. This is going to be a bit more relevant than the other couple. To Stoics, the universe is material. So, so far, there's some common ground with the Epicureans. It's logical. It can be understood by rational means. Uh, it has laws that are repeatable and knowable. But here's where things get a little bit more different. They believe that the universe is alive, that the universe is the expression of the mind of its creator. And this creator they defined as um, a character they called the Demiurge. This is the Greek word for the craftsman or the creator, the, the um, handyman. The idea was that the Demiurge, this primordial divine being, created the universe as... <sighs> Sorry, pause a minute. Okay. They believed that this creation is something that was finished at the outset, that has um, a structure that is self-perpetuating, regular, and eternal. This is an inspiration for the kind of clockwork universe that we see coming out of Enlightenment era approaches to cosmology. They believed within this system, the Demiurge is not still interventionist, that this uh, creator god stands back because everything that happens is a consequence of that initial structure and that things run as they were meant to run. In this respect, they're a fate-heavy interpretation of reality. So they believe that what happens happens because that's the way it has to happen, that the structure of the cosmos itself creates events, and that because of this, the things that happen to you are in many ways unavoidable. Um, this isn't necessarily, uh, you can caricature this as a everything is fated, you have no control over your destiny kind of thing. Uh, that, I think, is an unfair assessment of Stoic thought. They did believe that you have free will within this. Your decisions are your own. They're somewhat structured by the kind of default personality and body and social status you're given at birth but that within these bounds, we do have choices. And those choices are massive in terms of affecting the degree to which we are harmed when the universe causes things to happen to us that are difficult or upsetting. They believed too that the best way to cope with these two realities, that humanity has a choice in how they respond to the circumstances of the universe, and that humanity does have some limited capacity of making choices that allow them to function more comfortably within a world that often feels very unfair on a subjective level. A uh, Stoic would say, it feels unfair because the system isn't made for you. The system is made for the system, and it functions as it is, not because it hates you, not because it loves you, it just is. So the thing that you can choose to do 
to make this work out a little bit better for you emotionally is to deliberately submit yourself to fate. So you can choose to accept that fate is going to do some stuff to you that's going to be really unpleasant. And that also fate is going to give you some good stuff. In the face of this mixed bag and in the face of the essential lack of control that an individual has within a determined universe, the best way to cope with instability is to free yourself from what Galen calls passion. And by passion, we mean, as we said at the first slide, your emotions, your controllable reactions, your um, animal self that um, experiences grief and rage and uh, uh, partly they want you to limit your reaction to these things because they see a lot of these as essentially destructive and counterproductive emotions, right? The horrible thing is happening to you either way. But sometimes the greatest suffering comes to us not because of the thing that's happened, but because of how we respond to that thing. Our response can massively increase the amount of psychological and sometimes physical pain that we feel from the event. And that to a stoic, a number one reason why this is so painful is that you're fighting the inevitable. You're putting upon yourself an unrealistic standard, benchmark, expectation, when you're telling yourself that you could have somehow avoided this or you must have done something to deserve this. Um, in other words, this is in part a fix for victim blaming. And here is where Stoicism has my most sympathetic ear because they're not wrong. Yeah, a lot of things happen to us that we don't get a say in. They happen not for reasons that are malicious or even capricious, although some of it is. I, there are horrible people who do horrible things. And the reasons why horrible people exist cannot be reduced to individual choice always. Because some of the things that make people horrible, um, we're finding when we look at you know, neuroscience and developmental psychology, some of them are things that the person can't help or are born with. We're still trying to figure out, for instance, good interventions in people showing early symptoms of psychopathy, um, especially violent psychopathy. Not all psychopaths are violent. Most of them aren't. Um, it's kind of unfair. But there is a overlap there, yeah? So understanding that a lot of the stuff that happens to us that is painful is not personal and is not our fault, it does kind of help and can be quite freeing. Now, within this, Stoics believed that all humans are essentially equal before fate. In other words, fate doesn't hate you any more than it hates somebody else. It doesn't love you any more than it loves somebody else. Fate just, just is. But they also believe that most humans, and again, this is a, a bit of an ableist philosophy because not all humans have the rational capacity to use stoicism to feel better. But for most people, the tools that can help you to live more comfortably within an unfair world, or not unfair, but cruel, um, difficult, um, tragic, upsetting, um, bigger than you, all of these, these things, um, is within the grasp of every person, right? The Stoics don't say, like, you have to buy a $200 blender to feel better about the world, or a shark tank. I don't know, what else would you buy to feel better? Me, I buy yarn. Yarn and one pound bags of butter popcorn jelly beans, don't judge me. So, mankind has the capacity to stop, process their feelings through a rational filter, and then create 
disciplines that help them to process painful and uncomfortable situations more uh, more tolerably. Now, this doesn't mean they didn't believe that social status wasn't a thing. Rather, they believed that an emperor and an enslaved farm worker are humans, both of them, and therefore equal in value and capacity, right? So Stoicism doesn't subscribe to a meritocracy, in other words. They don't believe that you're emperor because you deserve to be emperor, and with that, you're enslaved because you deserve to be enslaved, which for the ancient world, by the way, is a step forward. There were a lot of people who believed that enslaved people deserved it because either they or their ancestors chose not to die, but rather to be kidnapped in war and then trafficked, which is fucked up on a level that I really cannot unpack, but I'm sure I don't need to, right? You, you guys know that's not all right. Yes, that's really screwed up. <clears throat> now, if you understand this, if you understand that every human being has equivalent value and that social position is an accident, that circumstances are also accidents, um, then the Stokes go on to say, the one way that you can increase your happiness and mitigate your pain is by increasing your knowledge. This is the idea that if you know more about the structure of the universe, uh, especially the structure of the cosmos, you know also the mind of the creator. By understanding the rules, you can begin to unpick these erroneous reactions to painful situations. You remove survivor's guilt and shame and a sense of responsibility for your own victimization by understanding that many of the things that happen to you are not your fault. Many, most, for Stoic, probably all. You also become objective by knowing more about the structure of the world. You uh, you can detach from your circumstances and understand them at a scientific distance. You can use your rational mind to create a buffer between yourself and the unbearable present. Um, now, here is where I step away from Stoicism a bit. And um, I'm being a little bit more critical about Stoicism, partially because Stoicism gets very good press in modern popular understandings of ancient philosophy. This is due to a few things. Stoicism was a preferred philosoph uh, philosophical movement in early Christianity and some forms of academic Islam. Stoicism gets super, super popular as we move into the Middle Ages and early modern period. So we're living in a world where Stoicism has had massive impact and ideas that derive from Stoicism are now pretty mainstream, right? None of this is sounding all that surprising, is it? Um, yes, Jim Jims. Pardon me. All right, that was bedtime. Let's see if this holds. Where were we? Yes. Um, Stoics, however, had a bit of a dark side. So, so here I'm going to give you my critique of Stoicism, and I don't think this is a fatal one. I don't think Stoicism is illegitimate as a philosophical set. Like, I'm, I think it's doing a lot of really, really good stuff, which is why it's important to also unpack some of the, the problematic aspects. Now, for Stoics, the gold standard, and this isn't my metaphor, this is uh, something coming out of Stoics themselves when they're describing the the ideal end stage of a good Stoic, is that a father should be able to see his son die before his face and to maintain his tranquility because he understands that he couldn't have stopped it, that it was fated to happen, and that he can only control his reaction, and that if he's really internalized this lesson of the constructed cosmos, that he should be able to use that to bypass feeling the 
emotional agony that comes from losing a child to violence while you're watching. Um, now, I see why they're going there. I think their heart is in the right place. They're trying to imagine, okay, what is the worst possible experience the universe could throw at you? And they don't even have to imagine it that much because this happens to people. This is doubly horrifying because you know, this is something I might have to live through someday. Uh, we all might have to. Uh, it's not a safe world, yeah? So keeping that in mind, wanting to be able to reduce even the most critically devastating psychological pain is coming from a good place. Um, here's where it gives me pause. Believing that horrible things happen and that they are fated to happen can create a sense of complacency and also a disconnect when it comes to understanding and incorporating the pain of others. I think ultimately this runs the risk, and here I'm, I don't think this is true of Stoicism writ large, but I think this is a trap that Stoicism can cause you to fall into, is it gives you a license to disconnect from the pain of others in a way that I find troubling because it it is so easy in the face of the overwhelming tragedy of the world to dissociate from the other people who are going through pain somewhere else or even the people going through pain in front of our faces but we feel we can't do anything about it or the structures causing that pain are too large for us to conquer individually and so therefore we step back we detach we um, isolate our emotions from the experience all of this i don't think is good because it can be easy and it can cause us to make the mistake of thinking that there is always nothing we can do, or that we shouldn't try to change injustices. Um, this philosophy was very popular amongst upper class Romans caught up in the imperial government because so much of their situation was unstable. They had immense power, yes, but they're also the first in line for purges and assassinations and targets and so on. Um, but also, these are people who own other people. They are, all of them, even the ones I like, like Pliny the Elder, uh, they are engaging in human trafficking, and they are partially responsible for the um, living conditions of the people that they own, or owning people in the first place. And here, I'm, I'm going to go after Seneca the Elder a little bit, but I, I think he can take it. This is a, a Roman philosopher who at one point makes his offhand comment about uh, one of the enslaved people that he grew up with, that, oh my goodness, you know, this man is not that much older than me, but he looks so much older. My goodness, isn't fate unfair? I want to reach in and shake him and say, Seneca? This dude is not doing well because you are benefiting from the labor you're coercing out of him, dude. Now, I'm not saying that this is a fatal shot into stoicism. This belief in the equivalent value and equality of all human beings should and often did drive some stoics to push back at the notion that slavery was okay. Um, it did seem to bring about um, a certain understanding that one should perhaps limit the amount of damage done to enslaved people. We see this in Galen's On Passions, yeah? The victims of some of these rage episodes he talks about are enslaved people. 
And as we know from Law Week, yeah, these enslaved people are victims who cannot fight back against the injustice being done to them. Um, part of why Stoicism is such a favored strain of thought in early Christianity uh, cannot be separated from the large number of enslaved and formerly enslaved people who were part of the early Christian church, uh, just due to the situations in which it's created and the kind of people who were attracted to it as a philosophy, you did have a lot of people who needed ways to uh, deal with horrible circumstances beyond their control that were unjust, but also weren't inevitable. So stoicism was where they turned. So this, yeah, it's a trendy philosophy amongst enslavers and powerful people and Roman emperors, but it was also something that did work for a lot of people who were coerced into horrible situations and often coerced in such a way that they were complicit in the violence happening around them. Um, enslaved people could be ordered to beat other enslaved people. Uh, they didn't have the agency often to resist unethical orders given to them. How did you cope with that? How do you deal with being in a situation where you're asked to do something that you would not do, um, that you are pained in doing, but that if you don't do, you're going to have to pay a significant price for it. In that context, it makes sense to me why Stoicism took off the way it did. Finally, and something that may be a bit jarring after I've talked about how Stoicism was such a useful and compatible philosophy for people in very theistic religious sects, like early Christianity. Uh, early Christianity, indeed, Christianity in general, is a religion that has an afterlife as part of their uh, cosmology and belief system. Stoics believed there wasn't one. They thought that once death occurs, that's it. Your soul ceases to be as if you were never born. This is part of how they comfort themselves in the face of the death of loved ones is they said, um, with death comes an end of suffering. That in fact, it's people who believe in an afterlife who are really sadistic because afterlives include, for most people who believe in one, scenarios in which that afterlife is not a pleasant one, where there is um, you know, torment of some kind, some sort of like punishment. Uh, again, this is not all even like for the ancient Mediterranean, the majority of re religions have some version of this eternal punishment flavor after life. Greco Roman polytheism had one, early Christianity in some segments of the population did. Uh, most Christian sects still believe in a literal hell, so this is part of a cosmology that is shared by a lot of people who um, believe in a more interventionist God. So for Stoics, they said, you know, no, that's kind of screwed up. Part of how you deal with the fact that you will experience death and loss is if you believe that with that death comes nothing. I mean, no continued consciousness, yes, but no suffering. In this universe, and again, we're going back to our example of the father who sees his son die in front of his face, the argument goes, he'll realize that his son is now beyond being hurt, that when he's gone, he's gone. Nobody can cause further pain to him. And therefore, not only can you accept that it's happened, but ideally you can find some peace and some joy in that moment because the person you love will never have to experience the torment of either emotions that come from being in an unfair world 
or the struggle and the fight that you have to have to gain some measure of equanimity in the face of injustice. With erasure, according to this way of looking at the universe, the injustice just ends. I can see why that would work for people, and I respect the stance. I, obviously, I find a lot of value in this. But you know, you, you're never going to find a perfect belief system. In some ways, I think struggling with our belief systems is one of the more valuable things we can do with our souls. If, you know, you believe in souls. On to the Pythagoreans. Uh, this is another favorite of mine, and uh, it makes me sad that my explanation is going to fall short, because Pythagoreans are a group who based their answer to the question of suffering and death on mathematics. And I wish I could do them. I probably could if I gave everything up and tried really, really hard, but I don't feel that sad about it. I will do my best, but if you want to know more about this, there are plenty of places to look for information. The Pythagoreans are a sect founded by a dude named Pythagoras of Samos. He ended up in southern Italy at the end of his life. So this is a philosophical sect that pulls very heavily from uh, Italian populations and was therefore very influential in Rome. But it never achieved the kind of mainstream success that Stoicism and Epicureanism did because it's a little odd compared to other philosophical approaches to the universe. But this is the one that you've probably heard of without quite realizing you were hearing about it. Uh, the Pythagorean theorem, this is that Pythagoras. And that theorem does come from this philosophical sect. We now think of Pythagoreans mostly, if we think of them at all, as this early scientific mathematical movement. But they were so much more than that. They were a philosophical sect that leaned more heavily than most into this religious space. The Epicureans and Stoics, if you ask them, are you religious? They would have been like, oh, God, no, no, we're philosophers. We believe in rationality. What we do is not like religion at all. I mean, it's still a belief system, though. So... Uh, Pythagoreans, however, would have been like, no, 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 false dichotomy, guys, that to know the mind of the creator is to know the creation and that the gods are not incompatible with this kind of structure. So they believed that the world's rule system is all a matter of geometry and mathematical relationships. And that this dynamic unifying mathematical structure makes its imprint on every form of living and non-living thing in creation. And you can see this by looking at shapes and ratios that are repeated and replicated all across different kinds of matter, which is where this Pythagorean theorem thing has its origins. It wasn't just you know, an obsession with triangles, but they believed that this constant ratio of the sides of a triangle that could be described and couldn't be broken and could be used in order to understand all sorts of other things meant that we were seeing a fingerprint of the creator, essentially. It was a sign for them of an intelligent design and that understanding this ratio could help you to live more in harmony with the rest of the world you found yourself living in. Similarly, they believed in, believed in, uh, they found the golden ratio, this, um, I think it's what, like three to four, um, I'm not gonna be able to explain this well, but the internet will tell you if you're interested in the details that this ratio, because we find it in natural forms uh, from the 
the curl of, of a shell to the relationship of rectangle sides to each other that because this too was a mathematical pattern that could be seen across all kinds of different items in nature that this too was a fingerprint of the hand of the creator so therefore the study of math and applying math to the observed cosmos was in and of itself a form of worship and of spirituality, which is pretty cool. I, I like that. I enjoy this effort to blend and reconcile what we too often fall into an easy dichotomy with that like science and religion or like one thing over here and one thing over here and, and like, they're not meeting. That's unfair to both, really. Now, because they were looking to the natural world for cues about how the human organism fits into the web of life, they took the observation that a human body, we don't have claws, you know, fingernails are not great for taking down prey in the wild, our teeth are like pretty useless as predator teeth. If we had to chase down a wildebeest and eat it with just you know our fingers and our teeth and no clothes, we would have a very difficult time defeating the wildebeest, yes? Because of this, the Pythagoreans believed that human beings shouldn't eat meat, that our form suggested that our ideal food was plants. And so therefore, Pythagoreanism was an all-vegetarian sect. In fact, uh, vegetarians before the 1900s called themselves Pythagoreans, sometimes Neo-Pythagoreans. And you'll hear sometimes the mention of the Pythagorean diet. So this was one of the reasons that made Pythagoreans feel a little weird to non-Pythagoreans in the ancient world. If you're a vegetarian, you've experienced this too, that when you eat differently from the people around you, this creates a disproportionate social barrier. I think because we get very butthurt about people not sharing our food with us, we feel judged, uh, partly because as social animals, we bond with each other through the food and the eating. If you've had to eat around a food allergy, you've experienced this too, where sometimes it can feel awkward and weird and you feel left out, people feel judged, some people get like super evil and they put stuff in your food. And... <laughs> anyway, for the Pythagoreans then, they got made fun of for this a lot, but they kept to it. They stuck to their guns. This is a long-lived and early founded school of philosophy. This predates, I think, both Stoics and Epicureans, and it sticks around for a long time. There are always people who were up for this, and it's not just about the vegetarianism. They believed that animals have souls. All living things have souls, and these souls are valuable. They are sacred. They're worthy of our respect and our honor. So with the vegetarianism came animal rights and the ethical treatment of animals. Pythagoreans were really against, for instance, making animals fight for entertainment. Uh, they had you know, different responses to agricultural keeping and breeding of animals. I don't think they quite get to a vegan place. But we do get some of the first pushback for animal rights coming from Pythagorean circles. Which, uh, I have a soft spot for, I must admit. Pythagoreans also believed that women were equally as valuable as men. Now, they did ascribe to a binary, much like everybody else in the Mediterranean. They believed, they didn't believe that men and women were the same. So this is a qualified equality. This is, uh, for those of you who are familiar with the theological term, complementarianism rather than equivalence. So this is the idea that men and women have different perspectives. 
but each perspective is valuable and each mind is a human mind with equal rights to a place at the rational table. For this reason, many of the early and well, early Pythagorean philosophers and authors included a lot of our female authors. So some of our earliest women scientists are Pythagoreans, including Pythagoras's wife and perhaps his daughter. There's uh, some question about whether there's one Theano or two Theanos. I'm not going to get into it now. But this is built into the founding moments of Pythagoreanism, and this is something they continue to champion. And it's seen by the existence of Pythagorean women philosophers whose works are copied and kept until we hit the speed bump of the Middle Ages. This is a great sect to belong to then, if you're not a dude. Next up, they did believe in the life after death, but it's not, again, the life after death that's the dedicated underworld where your soul just hangs for all eternity. Rather, they believed that... Oh, gosh, sorry, my parents are calling. In the back, Dad wanted to talk about Stoics. He's hilarious. He's a uh, retired doctor who's a frustrated ancient philosopher, and it's just adorable. I love him. Which is nice because he's my dad. Okay, what were we talking about? How far had we gotten? Yes. Um, reincarnation, as I was saying earlier, is uh, part of the Pythagorean cosmos. Now, this might seem interesting to those of you uh, who are familiar with um, Hinduism and religions coming out of India, and you may wonder, is there a connection? You're not the only one, and probably there is. The Pythagorean movement begins at a time when s stable trade contact was just beginning between India and the Mediterranean. As that contract stabilized, contact rather stabilized, there may have been some cross-pollination inspiring Pythagorean beliefs. So it uh, might be a long-range uh, impact of Hinduism and uh, Hindu practices with regards to foodstuffs. We, however, don't have smoking gun proof of this, but it's more likely than not. The next one might be a little bit more counterintuitive. That is, Pythagoreans, although they were vegetarians, did not eat beans. They thought that beans were an inappropriate food. Beans are evil is a bit of an overstatement, but they avoided touching them or being around them. And it was such a thing that some historians of science have suggested that Pythagoras and his followers may have begun as a colony for people with a severe bean pollen and bean plant allergy called favism. This is pretty common-ish in the Mediterranean, but the Mediterranean is also a culture where beans form a large part of the food culture. So if you were allergic to beans, you would have had a really hard time functioning in mainstream society. A severe bean allergy can be so bad that even if you get exposed to pollen coming off a bean field at a certain season, you can have a reaction. So the argument goes, Pythagoras and his followers were a self-contained community in part so that they could avoid contact with beans. This makes sense. And it makes more sense knowing that Pythagoras ends up dying because he's pursued and killed by an angry mob for reasons that are somewhat unclear to me. And as he was running, he came to a bean field and then refused to go into a bean field, was captured and killed. So those who ascribe to the bean allergy theory say that, well, that makes sense as an action if you're so severely allergic to beans that you just won't go into the field. You'd rather do the angry mob than do the beans. As someone with food allergies, I kind of relate. Like, for me... My associations with chocolate are so painful and uncomfortable that I don't even like touching it. Although I did do a nice side business in college hiding people's chocolate so their roommates couldn't get it. So yay. 
also I, I have um, bean sensitivity, so I'm on team <laughs> beans. They make me seriously very ill. I don't have bean pollen issues yet, but you know, I I'd not want to risk it. Uh, hummus makes me nervous. So if you ever want to defeat me, come at me with hummus, and it'll probably make me feel threatened. No, it won't actually. I'm I'm cool. I'm fine. Hummus. Um another explanation if you don't buy the allergy theory. And the explanation that seems to be what Pythagoreans used to explain the principle when asked was that a bean is like an embryo, it's the plant baby, that eating a bean is a little bit like eating a plant's child and that's sort of icky. Uh, there also is a suggestion that they might have thought that beans look a little bit too much like testicles and therefore you probably shouldn't eat them because ew. We don't have a firm answer on this one. We're not likely to ever, but it makes for a really interesting question, doesn't it? But it is uncontested that Pythagoreans were vegetarians who wouldn't eat beans, what wouldn't, um, could not for philo philosophical reasons, which are valid reasons for could not eat beans. And this meant that they had to look for other sources of protein to supplement. So lupines are a big part of the Pythagorean diet. A lot of um, other kinds of plant proteins went into this. this it's a sustainable, nutritionally complete diet. The Pythagoreans are fine. Don't worry about them nutrition-wise. They're also not the only vegetarians in the ancient world, although they are one of the biggest groups to advocate it. Just nifty. Um, not vegan, however. Cheese was fine. And this helps with the no bean thing. But yeah, they were vegetarians who couldn't eat tofu. Next up. I said that Pythagoreans were a religion positive political sect, so much so that certain brands of Pythagoreanism leaned very heavily into their religious aspects. There seem to have been crossovers between the Orphic or Dionysiac mysteries. So these were a set of religious practices that you had to be initiated into, a little bit like Freemasons. You have to be initiated to find out all of the mysteries of Freemasonry. Similarly, the Orphic mysteries were a series of initiations that brought you further into that religious tradition. And these mysteries that were revealed to you were meant to help you deal with your fear of death. So this is immediately relevant to mental health. By participating in a Pythagorean sect that was also related to a religious sect that involved ceremonies and rituals and prayers and bits of poetry and knowledge that were meant to position you well for a good afterlife, you are engaging in therapeutic practices that help you deal with the psychological burden of confronting your own mortality in a world where that mortality was always really close. Uh, let's not forget the epidemics. In the Hippocratic epidemics, you have people dying very quickly, very unpleasantly, and with not a lot of interventions available to stop it. Imagine the, the stress of living through COVID-19 only without modern medicine and um, any kind of coherent quarantine or health policy or financial aid. Or, I, I'm not saying we're doing an amazing job. I'm just saying that historically it's been a lot worse and we could do better, but you know, it, it could be scarier. Is that comforting? I don't think that's comforting. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Pythagoreans weren't the most 
popular sect, partly because of their relationship to these mysteries, especially the Dionysian mysteries, because the mysteries of Dionysus lean very heavily into a race and class distinctions. Enslaved people participated on equal footing with free people, with elite people, and also the Dionysiac mysteries were gender inclusive like the Pythagoreans. Because of this, people thought that the Pythagoreans might be some kind of like down low sex cult. Because people are just haters sometimes. And therefore there were periods when Pythagoreans were expelled from various cities, were hunted down, they were considered suspect. It was never stamped out in any systematic way and in some cultures they did get a degree of respect especially in Rome because they were homegrown in Italy they were considered more respectable maybe than stuff that was from Greek speakers outside of Italy um, some Roman intellectuals were really into Pythagoras Ovid interestingly enough and Pythagoreanism did yield useful science, uh, lest we forget the fundamentals of the geometry that we still use as the basis of our um, mathematical skill tree come from the Pythagoreans. Of all of these philosophical sects, these are the most likely to have touched your intellectual life. So hats off, good job Pythagoreans. Um, for those of you wondering what's up with the pentagram, uh, this was one of several symbols that Pythagoreans used to demonstrate and refer to these geometric relationships that they found in nature and used as the basis for their mathematical constructs. Uh, I'm not going to explain much more than that because I'll do it wrong, but if you're really interested there's a Disney animation called Donald Duck and Math Magic Land that includes a lengthy discussion of how Pythagoreanism works. I'll link those in the show notes too because it's kind of cool. All right, so much for the Pythagoreans. Oh, yeah, here's Pythagoras, or at least a modern illustration of Pythagoras with all of his math demo stuff. And the this spiraling sequence here. Oh, drat, I'm forgetting the name of this thing. And you guys are probably screaming it at this lecture right now. Uh, this is a set of nested golden triangles, each within themselves, and they can be nested infinitely to form this spirally shape whose ratio conforms to the spirals we see in snail shells and uh, other natural formations. Fibonacci spiral? Is that it? I'm so sorry, mathematicians. I suck at this. Let's move on before I expose my shameful lack of math ability further. In case you're wondering where Samos is, here's a map. This isn't necessary. When you go to review the slides, it'll be here. Samos is along the coast of Asia Minor, modern day Turkey. Again, this is in that hot zone of cross-cultural sharing that produces all kinds of scientific movements, including the Hippocratics. And then Croton in the very, it's like the, the soul of the, the ball of the foot of Italy is where Croton is. This is where Pythagoras moves. This is where his movement gets started. This is where they had their um, math cult colony. And this is where Pythagoras is eventually killed by an angry mob for reasons. Alas, not the only philosophical icon to get killed by angry mobs. <clears throat> Socrates. On to the cynics. These are fun. They take their name from the Greek word for a dog, a kuon, and we get the word cynical from them, but it doesn't really capture the flavor of original recipe cynics. Cynics, like the Pythagoreans and the, well, pretty much everybody on this list, they believed that we should take our cues from the natural world when we were figuring out how humans should best live. 
However, they go in a bit of a different direction from the Pythagoreans with this. So they observe that humans aren't born with clothes on. Humans aren't born with customs or manners. All of these are constructs. And that social constructs, more often than not, don't perpetuate ideas that conform to rationality and wisdom and ethical behavior. In fact, a lot of them perpetuate the opposite, injustice and inequality. Because of this, they concluded that anything that isn't in conformity with nature is actively bad because it's going to stand between you and accessing a natural and ethical and um, fulfilling lifestyle. They think that all of these social rituals and constructs, they get in the way of having a life that is best informed by philosophical truth. And they're kind of onto something a bit. Social pressure and social structures does indeed often put us in a situation where we choose to do things that we ourselves feel are immoral. They put us in situations where our choices are limited, and so we have to engage in something that we know does harm. But for instance, with food buying, we may know that something has not been grown in a sustainable fashion, that the pesticide load used to make that tomato is doing direct damage to the environment. We may know that the gas burn to get that grocery to the grocery store is actively contributing to climate change. And yet we only have the money we have to buy that tomato. We don't have land in our apartment to grow a tomato. We can't use our spare time to indulge in agriculture. So unless we quit our lives and move to the country and form a hippie commune where we grow our own food, and this has occurred to me on more than one occasion, we're going to have to engage in supporting a harmful structure with our money because we are part of a system that coerces us into unethical choices. In order to deal with this, Cynics engaged in a combination of activism and protest that was meant to highlight the artificiality and absurdity of social conventions and also highlight the damage that these social conventions do. Uh, for them, by the way, unnatural includes mores like um, norms that don't have a real purpose, including like superstitions and uh, customs that you just do to do. Uh, also, cynics seem to have included avoiding hurting people's feelings in this range of things. Technology, they also felt was unnatural, uh, especially technology that impacted the local environment. In many ways, cynics become part of the early environmental movements. And there was an environmentalist movement in antiquity. Uh, no, I did this on the Pliny the Elder lecture. Oh my God, stay on topic, Jones Lewis, come on. Right. They also thought that climbing corporate ladders, this also gets in the way of your pursuit of wisdom because it's unnatural, right? Social structures are unnatural. Nature doesn't make humans kings or enslaved people or paupers or employees or whatnot like nature makes humans humans and any kind of structure that places one human in value over another human in value to cynics was offensive nationalism also this idea of patriotism and toxic xenophobia, this to them would have been offensive and counter wisdom because saying that a human being who speaks Greek is more valuable than a human being who doesn't, which was something that was a mainstream belief at the time when the cynics became active, that to them was offensive and unnatural. Now, so far, so good. But then living in houses, wearing clothing, uh, so much so that a lot of cynic philosophers were homeless by choice. 
there's this story told about Diogenes, um, he's the, the guy pictured in the Victorian art thing I've put on this slide. For those of you who are just listening to this, this is a dude and he's sitting inside a pithos jar, those large jars that were used to bury people. These were the equivalent of ancient refrigerator boxes and a lot of homeless people would live inside them, um, cracked and discarded pithos jars, which is what Diogenes did. He's hanging out with his puppy because he's a cynic, so they had doggies. Yay! Um, this, however, doesn't come out of dog positive language. Uh, their opponents called them cynics because dogs don't care about social structures and they don't care that it's inappropriate to hump your leg. They'll just hump your leg because they're a dog and they that's what they do. But cynics were like, yeah, the dog has the right idea. Why shouldn't we hump your leg in public? Mm, bless their hearts. Okay. And then inside of his refrigerator box slash pithos jar, he's holding this lantern and kind of gazing at it contemplatively. I'm going to tell you the Diogenes stories behind that and then a, another related one. One of the things he did as a part of his activism and outreach was in the middle of the day with a lit lamp, not a Victorian one like the one we're looking at, but an ancient you know, oil lamp. He went around like peering into the streets with the lamp and when people were like, Diogenes, what the fuck are you doing? Diogenes would be like, I'm looking for a wise man. Have you seen one? Have you seen, are you one? Are you one? Are you? And they were like, oh my gosh, Diogenes, a lantern is not going to help you find wisdom. And he's like, ah! Uh -huh. A little bit of a better Diogenes story, although less iconic, is one where he saw a little boy who was drinking out of a a fountain with his hand and not a cup and then Diogenes like threw away his cup and people were like why did you do that Diogenes it's the only thing you own is this cup and he's like I realized that I don't need it I can be free of it this is the better story because it makes the point cynics weren't disavowing this stuff just because it's unnatural but they felt that every unnatural thing that we agree to in our life separates us further from true happiness and that by realizing that our needs are artificially created and socially determined that we don't need that cup we don't need that extra straw we don't need that plastic bag by doing that we make ourselves free and we make the world a better place for everyone at least that's that's the hope. I don't think that having a cup is going to hurt anyone. If it's ceramic, plastic, yes. And straws get in sea turtles' noses and it can't be unseen. And it makes me very upset. So let's move on. Um, this proves the point, the next one on the list, that self-sufficiency for them is the key to happiness. This, in many ways, is the opposite of stoicism. Although there, there's some similarities here too. They're saying that one of the ways you make yourself less dependent on other people for happiness and on unfair social structures to give you validation and support is by getting rid of them. If Facebook is making you anxious, a Stoic would say, get rid of the Facebook. You don't need that. It's getting in the way of you experiencing contentment and real community. Are gender norms getting in your way of being able to recognize your fellow person's humanity? Well, then get rid of them. Uh, the cynics like the Pythagoreans are one of these schools where there were a number of notable women who were uh, leaders in thought and activism within the cynic community. So this is a, another gender equal, equality movement in the ancient world, and one that's maybe a bit more progressive than the Pythagoreans even. Uh, one of them is, oh, drat, I'm forgetting her name at the moment, but one of the things she did to prove that oh, social norms are artificial and stupid is she uh, came to a feast, took off her clothes, and then peed on the table. <laughs> Um, which, okay, yes, gross, but she was making a point. She wasn't just doing this to do it. She was doing it to say, look, 
why do you care what clothes are on my body? What does that mean? Am I any less of a person with my clothes or without my clothes? Like the, the clothes are irrelevant. The clothes are getting in the way of your ability to relate to me as a human. Likewise, this feast, right? Why are we so offended that someone pees on a feast table? I mean, yeah, it spoils the food and it's gross, but why are we privileging this food? You know, why are we creating a special set of food that we're only giving to a few people? Why do we have this ritual where, as in ancient feasting you did, people are seated in order of rank. Often feasts were used to reinforce social order. Enslaved people would serve, free people would sit and eat. These were also, during her time, um, sex segregated asterisks. So the only official guests at these were felt to be properly men, although philosophers would break this rule and different cultures did this differently. Etruscans, women could be guests at feasts and in Rome too. But in her time, this was a male thing. And the only women who were at these symposia were women who were providing entertainment or doing sex work or both of the above. So by saying, okay, I'm here, I'm in this place. Um, she, I think, was from a rather elite family. So by stripping and disrespecting the symposium, she was making a social statement saying, why are we valuing this? This isn't worth our time. This exercise doesn't make us happier. It doesn't lead to a more just world. Uh, if anything, it's a performative overconsumption of food that we don't need that's going to make us sick because we're overeating. This, all of this, is a distraction to what we should be focusing on. That is wisdom of approaching the world as it is understanding it on its own terms, and living a life where your happiness isn't controlled by circumstances or things or destructive practices. Now, it has been pointed out, and I'm just going to throw this out here, that one could consider Jesus of Nazareth to be a member of the Cynic tradition. And b before you find this too flustering, let me explain a bit. Uh, starting with this uh, incident that those of you who are familiar with Christianity may know, but if you're not, I'm going to tell the story. At one point, Jesus goes into the temple at Jerusalem and he sees that, as in most temples in the ancient Mediterranean, there are ritually pure animals being sold to people who are coming to sacrifice them at the temple. And this allows the temple to control both the sale of sacrificial animals and also to turn a profit off of people's religious observances. And in response to this, Jesus takes out a whip, he flips the tables, he starts whipping all of the money changers. Um, they're changing money, so you'd bring your normal money into the temple and then you'd buy temple tokens and you'd use the temple tokens to buy the sacrificial animals, and that was the only way you could buy the sacrificial animals. This meant that nobody could um, take the temple tokens and use their spare change anywhere else. Like once you bought temple tokens, you had to spend them in the temple, like you know, Amazon coins or other forms of non-currency currency that force you to shop in one place. And as he's doing this, as he's flipping the tables and whipping the money lenders and um, essentially breaking up the scene in this act of destruction, he says, look, you have taken my father's house, that is the temple, and you've turned it from his place into a hangout for crooks, that you're using what should be a holy space to make money off of people's faith, and that is f***ed up, yeah? This is only one of several moments where Jesus is directly confrontational, where he breaks a social norm and then uses that moment where his audience is like, oh my god, I can't believe you did that thing. That thing is not the rules. No, no. And Jesus is like, hey, look, 
the rules are creating an unjust situation and they are distracting us from noticing what should be our primary focus. That is, poor people are being exploited and being made further poor in a place that should be their safe space where they should be given first place and where the wealthy should step the heck back. This is um, a pretty core cynic tactics is to create a confrontation, to create a scene and use that as a teachable moment for real and lasting change in the ethical framework of the culture. I don't necessarily think that's like the one correct way of reading Jesus here. I'm just pointing it out because it's easy to be like, oh my God, the cynics are a mess. What the heck is going on with them? And that does them a disservice because their the spiritual ancestors for pretty much every activist movement that ever made things more just for people in an oppressive environment. So for that, they have my affection. Uh, making comfortable people uncomfortable in order to make life better for more humans, for me at least, is a noble and worthy goal. And if you offend some people in the process, sometimes that's what you got to do. All right. Oh, this is the last slide. So with that happy thought, I leave you to enjoy your reading and to think about ancient philosophy as therapy. All of these ways of looking at the world ultimately gave to ancient people tools for coping with unfairness, methods for making unfair things more fair, and ways of including and normalizing mental health issues. Um, and this is the, the last idea I want to throw out here where ancient people drew the line between mental illness and normal mental functioning was a little bit different from the line that we have in America. We, or no, I'm gonna stop with the we and say just in general, this process is called pathologizing. That is drawing a line that separates healthy slash normal from abnormal slash unhealthy. The thing on the abnormal side of that line is the thing that's pathologized. So we call that illness and the other thing healthiness. But anyone who's been a human knows that it's not either or, there's a spectrum. We can be at various different points on a slider between mentally unwell and mentally well. And there are advantages and disadvantages to construing mental distress as a form of illness. It's advantageous because it takes mental health seriously. It says that mental illness, like physical illness, is dangerous and destructive and deserves our intervention and our treatment. On the other side, creating a space of mental illness discrete from normal mental structures, and this is really true when we talk about neuroatypicalities, by saying that anything that is not normal is a disease, creates a stance towards people who experience mental difference and neurodiversity that is othering, that is exclusive, that um, avoids acceptance and inclusion. It exaggerates the dangers of these people and sometimes um, negates their humanity in a way that actively discourages people from seeking treatment when they are feeling um, distressed from mental illness. Ancient people drew this line at a much different place. They did recognize that mental illness was a thing. 
interestingly, they didn't consider it as completely different from physical illness. They thought of the mind as part of the body in the same way that we're just now coming back to as we realize the degree that uh, brain structure, neurochemistry, genetic makeup plays and how our mind functions and what the landscape of our soul is. But in ancient times, this would have been just a normal concept. They did understand that the brain was the seat of cognition. They understood that changes to the brain can cause changes to the personality. They understood that traumatic brain injury and illness can cause mental changes. And for these reasons, they thought of mental illness as part of your physical wellness. This is why you get things like uh, the Hippocratic Dreams, Regimen 4, where the mind is part of the diagnostic apparatus. You're looking at dreams because your mind is part of your body and your mind knows stuff that's going on with your body. The idea is that your dreams are a way of accessing parts of the unconscious. It's like an early, very primitive form of this theory of unconscious versus conscious cognition. They normalized a lot more things that we would class as diseases. For instance, clinical depression and depressive episodes, they thought of as a regular thing that everybody would have to learn how to deal with. At least philosophers do. It's part of their um, assumption framework is that sometimes everybody is going to experience the symptoms of depression. Uh, similarly, anxiety, especially anxiety, gets treated like part of the normal spectrum of things. There's even an early understanding um, that anxiety can create breaks from reality and also specific symptoms linked to trauma. Certainly the earliest descriptions of what we would now call PTSD come from ancient texts. Uh, the first one is described in Herodotus, uh, a man who survived, I think, the Battle of Marathon, uh, was physically uninjured but was unable to see after the date of that battle. Today we would call this um, traumatic blindness. It's, it's a thing that happens as part of a trauma response constellation. There are also descriptions of what we now recognize as PTSD-fueled um, breaks with reality, uh, psychoses, um, triggering episodes. Descriptions exist. There's not a name for it as a syndrome, but it's something that ancient psychological texts often mention and address. Explosive rage is in there. Now, the kind of mental illness that ancient people felt was problematic was a combination of an inability to perceive reality in a safe and accurate way. So the idea of hallucinations, of um, misperception of reality, of mistaking people for other people, of thinking you're in one situation when actually you're not in that situation. That's part of what they lumped into this sort of undifferentiated category of mental illness. There isn't really an ancient DSM as such. Uh, along with that was also a recognition of uh, manic states. In fact, the, the name manic state comes from mania, which is the Greek word for uh, this combination of loss of control with high energy, which isn't quite, I mean, it's sort of what a manic episode can be like sometimes. Um, but this also encompasses situations you experience when you have psychotic symptoms, where you see and hear and perceive things that aren't there, uh, either as part of a mental illness or as part of a neurological dis disorder. And again, we're still working on teasing out like where that line is today. The brain is still very much a frontier. This was felt to be mental illness dangerous enough to be part of a legal category. We don't see a lot of information aimed at treat. Well, no, that's not necessarily true. There are some early attempts to intervene with pharmacy in these kinds of episodes, especially psychotic breaks.
So that's that's kind of the happy news is they're already thinking about pharmaceutical solutions to mental illness. However, their solution is to give large doses of hallucinogenic things. Um, hellebore was a big one, which can be toxic in large doses. So you can die from this, but it causes you to experience hallucination, to vomit, to um, have convulsive episodes. It makes you very, very sick. And the thought was that it shocks your system. And then when you come out of it, you'll perceive reality again. This is in many ways the ancestor of electroshock therapy and other sorts of uh, violent and sometimes, well, sometimes often abusive interventions that have littered the road to kinder and more appropriate approaches to mental illness. So in general, the ancient world does some things really well when we're talking about mental illness. Uh, for the most common forms of mental illness, there isn't a lot of stigma. There's not a lot of shame in admitting to feeling symptoms of depression or anxiety. In fact, it's so normalized that it's one of the go-to discourses in philosophy. So it's, you're not gonna get shamed for admitting that you're anxious or experiencing depressive symptoms or feeling like harming yourself. That is felt to be within the normal range of human emotions. Now, there is a, a degree of normalization of self-harm and suicide that gives me a lot of pause. What the ancient world doesn't do very well, unfortunately, is recognizing and preventing and treating trauma responses. They kind of know it's there, but their method of dealing with it is less, unless you're a cynic, the, the cynics do a pretty good job of saying like, look, um, systemic issues create trauma and systemic uh, injustices once removed will reduce the le level of collective trauma. Gold star, they're not wrong. But for most doctors in the ancient world, they were more about not questioning the social factors that led to the trauma and instead treating the patient with um, various drugs and regimen until they either like gave up and rage quit or were harmed or maybe it helped for some people. I don't have IRB approval to investigate any of this, nor do I want to. Final thought here is that for all of this, mental health is a part of ancient medicine. It's something that we see not just doctors, but a lot of intellectuals applying their energies toward uh, encountering and um, improving. This is a space where we see a lot of the beginnings of what later become extremely powerful forces for making the world more just and more kind. And it's part of a process that we're still working on, yeah? Because mental health is something that we still don't do a very good job with. There's a lot of philosophical work that still needs to be done in order to make access to mental health care destigmatized and available for the people who need it the most. There's a lot of work that needs to be done for making mentally ill people uh, more comfortable and more at home in the societies that they're a part of. And the same goes for non-neurotypical people. Uh, we could do a lot better about including people who are not neurotypical in our society and our friend groups. But I am heartened that we're still trying that this is a conversation I can have with you without worrying that you guys are going to be like, <laughs> no, we don't want to include mentally ill people in our society. Like, that is historically kind of newish. And that's a happy thing uh, because, like, <sighs> human life and human happiness and human function isn't just a nice extra, it's important. 
Because whether you believe there's an afterlife or no afterlife, we do know that there is a now life and that this now life can be made better just by how our structures support those of us who are most vulnerable and how we ourselves behave towards ourselves and other people who are experiencing distress. This is something we can fix now, and this is something we can study to fix better in the future. And that's where I'm going to leave you. Be well, take care, stay classy, take care of your people, and carry on, guys. Much love.